how's everyone doing? So guys, <clears throat> I have a, it's not like a topic topic, but I just wanted to talk about uh, something that I think you guys are going to be interested in hearing. And so, um, uh, so listen on, because this is some really good stuff that you're about to hear. Now, um, I know everyone knows about how delayed, how delayed USCIS is. People have been waiting for their cases to be heard for a long time. And um, it seems to be taking longer and longer, but there's certain categories, and I'm gonna talk about um, a family base where it's actually getting shorter. So thank you guys for joining me and thank you, Mr. Task, for joining me. Uh, please let me know you're here, comment, uh, post something in the comment section. And um, I'm just gonna chit chat with you guys about really what's going on, right? Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Ifama Odolami. I am an immigration attorney. My office is in New Jersey, but I work with clients in all 50 states. I think I have clients in maybe 40 out of 50 states, right? And um, we work with them and we put their cases together and my office is passionate about helping fellow immigrants because I am an immigrant and it is my joy to help other immigrants to get the American dream, right? And I keep telling you guys that in my family, we have, you know, we not, neither of us were, none of us were, was born here in the United States, but we all have our papers, except my sister in the UK, who lives in the UK. And the reason is because I came here, I went to school, got my papers through my husband who came here on a J1 himself, got his papers through his employer. And, you know, you change the dynamics of your family. You're able to file for other people, other members of your family to come. My husband and his family filed for their mom, siblings. So really when you come in here to the United States, um, you get your paper and then you look to, bring your family member. That's the way it's always been. That's the American way. So I'm going to answer questions and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but I just want to talk about something really, really quick. Um, and what I want to talk about today is timing. Timing is everything. And the reason I say this is sometimes when you don't make use of a good time, you might lose the opportunity. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about marriage-based interviews. I'm going to actually start with marriage-based interviews, and then I'm going to talk about SIJS if I have some time. So you guys know during the last administration, it was so hard for, you know, uh, for people to get their papers because the last administration was very anti-immigrant, right? Immigrants, as far as we're concerned, were responsible for everything bad going on. And there was this huge anti-immigrant uh, uh, sentiment. Now, during that administration, there was a policy of interviewing every, I mean, pretty much every couple, every marriage-based petition, they called them for an interview. And what this did was it created a really long backlog. That, in addition with COVID, it was untenable. So this administration has is doing the opposite. Recently, they've gone back to the way it used to be where officers could ex exercise their independent judgment. You look at an application and you decide, well, is this application sufficient? Do I believe on the, on the basis of the papers filed alone that this is a bona fide marriage, right? That's the law, that a bona fide marriage is what they're looking for. And when do they determine whether it's a bona fide marriage? At the time you get married, at the time you get you got married, did you decide? Did you, were your intent on uh, was it your intention to live with your spouse and have a a, a family or have a life together? And uh, was it your intention to be together, not necessarily for immigration benefits, right? Not only for immigration benefits, because maybe you want to marry at that time because this is the right time because then you can work. But it's a real relationship, right? So. Now, the, what you need to know is that this policy, it's not law. This is not law, right? It's a policy, which means that each administration 
can do it differently. So this administration, the Biden administration, has decided that um, it really wants to move this backlog, right? People are waiting for work permits, waiting for their loved ones to join them. It's, it's getting so much. So what they have decided is if you're in the United States and you file with a, a USCIS service center and your application is sufficient for them, you, you will get your green card without having to go through an interview, right? So if you are in this position, why are you waiting? File your papers now. All right. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that could help you um, get your papers together, at least to present that sufficiency that they're looking for. But before that, I want to talk about another category where not putting your paperwork on time has caused a delay. And I'm talking about special immigrant juvenile status. So back about two years ago, there was the priority date was current for most countries. So the priority date was not current for the Northern Triangle countries, you know, such as um, uh, Mexico, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and other countries, right? Some of the other countries, but for most of the countries, at least most of my clients, the priority date was current. So when we filed for the SIJS, we would file the adjustment of status at the same time, the work permit, the I-131, everything in one filing. The clients would begin to get their work permit within month four by seven months, eight months, nine months, they got a green card. And typically it was without an interview. We never had an interview on the SIJ case, SIJS cases. Now guess what happened March of this year? The priority date retrogressed. So whereas the priority was current two years ago and then stopped being current in 2022, but wasn't so bad, now the priority date is back to 2018. So what does that mean? That means that we can, can we, we can no longer file an I-360, which is the SIJS uh, form, together with the I-485. So what that means is that you, you file the I-360 alone. If that's approved, then the person, the child now has to wait for two, three, maybe even four years to, to get on the line to be able to apply to get a green card. This is something that we were able to do in less than a year. Just time, it passed. So if you were able to file an SIJS case maybe last year, two years ago, and you didn't, now this is, you know, that's a situation now. So for those who have a pathway to a green card, do not tarry, do not delay. All right. So if you're looking to file a marriage-based petition, let me come back to the marriage-based petition. If you're looking to file the marriage-based petition, what are the things that you need to submit to make it more likely that you will meet this um, standard that the officers are looking for right now, which is that they just want um, a petition that, you know, smacks of a bona fide relationship, right? So what are they looking for? Well, first of all, you want to have proof that a person who's filing for you has, is, you know, is a U.S. citizen or green card holder. So you have to have whatever proof that is, right? Because if you don't have it, they'll send you an RFE that delays your case. You want to have proof that there's a qualifying relationship, which is that there's a marriage license, you're married to the person. If you're divorced, um, you have your divorce decree properly authenticated for those countries where authentication is an issue. Um, you want to have that, right, at the minimum. Then you want to have proof that it's a real bona fide relationship, right? And to prove that, USCIS likes to see that you live together. Maybe sometimes you don't live together, but you have to be able to explain why you don't live together. For instance, if one person is in school and the other person has a job somewhere and you can't live together because of that, you want to explain that up front so that they understand that, right, you know, without having to figure out why you guys have different addresses, right? You also want to show that you, are, you have some financial commingling, right? I know for some people, when you're newly married, sometimes it's a little difficult to have all of this, but do the best you can. Hmm? Sometimes it might just be text messages, um, uh, pictures, you know, showing your vacation or showing you with your family members or showing you, um, you know, um, you know, doing things that couples do, you know, um, it could be your, 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 um, itinerary to wherever you travel to 
It could be um, attending uh, your child's um, or stepchild's um, uh, concert, you know. Um, but if you have enough of the really good warm evidence, right, then it may not matter that you have not been able to file your taxes because you just got married, right? So really put as much as you can. Sometimes even putting things from when you were dating might be helpful. Um, you want to have proof that you live together, you know, so if you have um, a joint, uh, what is it, uh, a lease agreement, a mortgage, uh, uh, affidavits from a landlord or whoever you're living with, that would be helpful. Um, you want to show that um, if you have affidavits from people who know you properly written affidavits, not the ones that just say, um, I know that they are a, a, a real couple and please approve this. No, talk. the person should talk about how they know you, both of you, how they know it's a real relationship, such as, oh, we travel together all the time, or um, I've attended a lot of you know events at their house and I've seen them together, or um, we go golfing all the, all the time, our kids are friends, we know them very well, they are our neighbors, so we know that it's a real relationship because we see them every morning when we're taking our kids to the bus stop, whatever, but it has to be, um, you know, you have to put information in there so that um, USCIS um, is, you know, you give them that information that they're looking for. And um, now, the other two things that you really want to make sure that you put together properly is the I-86 for that's the affidavit of support. Now, your spouse, your American spouse or green card holder spouse has to be making a certain amount of money. So, you want to make sure that form is properly filled, properly completed, and you want to make sure that all the um, attachments that are needed are put together. So you have to put your taxes, the W-2s, 1099s, whatever it, whatever um, is needed. So you can't file the I-864 with just taxes without your W-2s. you get an RFE or without the 1099s or whatever it is that make up your income. And if you're not making enough income, then get a joint sponsor and get a joint sponsor who's um, who it's clear qualifies. Because if it's not clear that they make enough money, that could be another reason that your case may, you know, you get an RFE and it delays your case. So you're looking to get this case to go as fast as possible and you wanna be able to get through without being called for an interview. And another thing you need to do is complete the I-693 and put it with the application. The I-693 is the medical form. Make sure you have um, a civil surgeon, which is what it's called for, um, the, these are the doctors that do the tests for immigration. Make sure you get a civil surgeon, um, go to the website, um, put your, um, your uh, zip code in and it will tell you the civil surgeons in your area. Um, make sure that you complete that and typically that uh, envelope has to be sealed. Do not open it and put it together with your submission and send it by some kind of uh, mail that can be tracked so that you know it has arrived, okay? So those are the tips I have for you today. And I'm telling you, right, it's not like people are avoiding interviews because they're, they're not in a real marriage. It's because it's so stressful. Sometimes the questions they ask you, you know, just honestly, even a couple who have been married for years would not know the answer to it, some of those questions. And so it creates this unnatural pressure to perform. You know, they ask you um, uh, questions such as, does your spouse have any scars? Listen, guys, I've been married for 21 years. I don't know if my, I don't know all the scars on my husband's body and I'm pretty sure he doesn't know all the scars on my body. So when you ask that question and you miss out on that, it looks like, oh, you don't, you know, it can't be a real relationship because how do you not know this or how many um, uh, tattoos they have? And sometimes the questions are just um, not properly put. So the person who answers it misunderstands it. And then next thing you get an RFE or you get annoyed, it's stressful. So if you can get through this process without an interview, I recommend and I encourage you to do so. So let me answer some questions. Thank you guys for joining. Hi, Ayodili, how are you? Hi, Alaji, thank you. My pleasure, it's my pleasure to come on live again. I had some time today, so I was like, let me get in really quickly and uh, 
talk about this because we've gotten, I'm, I, I kid you not, all our cases in the few, last few months have been approved without an interview. And that's because from the beginning, even before it was this policy of, you know, to, it was a policy to, um, um, to wait interviews for um, packages that are befitting, we've always submitted uh, good submissions. Like we, we try to make sure that we have enough of the good stuff so that when it goes there, the officer can see that it's a legitimate relationship. So Mr. Tusk, let's see what question you have. You said you filed for your I-751 based on cruelty and divorce and you're waiting. Can I get remarried to my girlfriend, an American, while still waiting for my I-751 to be adjudicated? That's a really, 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 really great question. And you know something? Um, you can, right? Because the I-751 actually does not, I have to check on this because I don't, the I-751 does not require you to be, um, to be unmarried. But if the answer is not correct, I'll come back and tell you guys. But um, it's only VAWA I'm aware of that says that you must not marry until your VAWA is approved. So let me go to Elijah. Elijah says, hello, best attorney, VAWA pending, VAWA pending to divorce or not to divorce. What is the best thing to do? Honestly, Elijah, it's up to you. If you want a divorce, it's up to you because VAWA only requires that you file the divorce within uh two years of the of the of the divorce you have to file your vow within two years of the divorce but if you have filed your vow already then it's really up to you the only thing is sometimes you know there are people who you know like if you file your vow and you get a decision that is not approved like your it's denied if it's been over two years you can't file another you cannot refile another vow on the other hand, sometimes it's best not to be with somebody who has been abusive to you because being in a marital relationship has certain connotations, you know, financial, you could be responsible for some of the things that some of the debts they're piling on because you're still a married couple, or they may have a, a, a legal say in your matter that you don't want. So it's a decision you have to make for yourself. All right. Uh, <laughs> Rodolfo Gonzalez says, hello, I have a great feeling about you. I will contact you soon. Hi, Rodolfo. Well, thank you. And contact us. We're waiting to talk to you, okay? And uh, we're here to assist you. Uh, Ram IJ says, Ram IJ says, let's look. This looks like a good question. He says, my wife has a removal order from 10 years ago from a, a de denied asylum. I'm a U.S. citizen. I file I-130. If it's approved, can she get her case straight? Ram G, this is a really great question. So let me answer it. So your wife has a removal order. And um, typically, the question is, we all we want to know what the removal was based on, right? Was it based on, okay, you say it was asylum denied. So you're a US citizen. So if you get an I-130 approved, then you have to make a motion to the judge, to the court to reopen that removal case. And uh, when, once you reopen that case, then you're able to hopefully terminate it. Then if, you, if you're able to do that as well, then you, you're trying to get the case back to USCIS so that you can file an I-485. And we do a lot of this, actually, a lot, a lot, a lot of this. And so make sure that you get an attorney that knows what they're doing. But yes, um, if there's no other inadmissibility, um, your wife should be able to get her paper. It's going to take a little while, but she should be able to get her papers. All right. Uh, Danny Claus Rogers says, when you file just the I-360, can they send you the receipt notice for only the I-360? Uh, Danny, Danny Claus, thank you for that question. Um, when you file any form, the receipt is proof that they got it. That's what it is. So if you file only an I-360, you'll get only an I-360 receipt. You're not going to get an I-485 or 765 or 131. You just get the I-360 receipt. And if you haven't received the receipt for, say, three, four months, you want to really make sure that they got it, okay? That's the reason why you get the receipt, because that's proof that they got it. So let me look at Instagram. I didn't forget you guys. Uh, my Instagram is on my phone, so let's see. Oli Pop says, if you if you did not submit your medicals while filing, can you still get a waiver? 
what kind of waiver are you looking to get? And what kind of case is this? Because if you do not submit your medicals when you're filing, USCIS will request the medical when it's ready to work on your case. They'll send you an RFE. Now, waiver being thrown in there is a whole different thing. So I'm not really sure what you're asking. Uh, Lord Mercy 681 says, can someone file for asylum after staying in the United States for five, five years? Well, Lord Mercy, you know that you're re required to file asylum within one year of your entry. However, in some instances, if something is happening in your country or something has happened that makes it, um, makes, makes it, that makes it impossible for you to go back because now there's a, uh, you're going to be persecuted, then that there could be an exception to that. But you want to know that typically the law is that you have to file your asylum within one year of coming to the United States. All right. Um, Sonia says, I am a 10-year green card holder. I have been physically physically present, I guess is what you're saying. I'm just adding some words because I think that's what you're saying. You've been physically present for four years and six months in the United States. Can I, st can I start filing for naturalization now? My green card is not marriage based. Thank you so much. Okay, so Sonia, you've had your green card for you attend, you've had it for four years and six months. So it's 90 days before. 90 days before. So that would be four years and nine months. Four years and nine months, 10, 11, 12. And then you can apply for naturalization. Okay. Don't make it earlier than that because they would deny it. And another thing is you want to make sure that wherever you live, you've lived there for, I think it's three months so that uh, you qualify to file in, file in that state. And even though um, it looks like it's really, um, it's just a naturalization, you want to make sure that you have no inadmissibility issues because even though you have a green card, that does not mean that your naturalization will be given to you. And sometimes when people apply for naturalization, um, they can actually get their green card taken away and they could be put in deportation. So make sure you have no issues with your green card. I kind of think you're okay because, um, you know, it was a marriage based on hopefully you don't have any criminal records, right? All right. So Lily Gabriel says, I want to ask a question for my cousin. All right. Uh, and the question is, when is the fee increment likely going into effect? I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, but they told us it's going into place. We don't know when it's going to go. We don't know which ones it's going to affect. And so going on, I'm going to come back to face, uh, YouTube and Facebook. So uh, CB title says, if I met my spouse abroad and we get married, how do I prove we live together if we live in different countries and I, I visit him a lot? How do I prove that? So um, CB title, your case is probably, it's like a consular processing case, right? Because you don't live together and there are ways to prove a bona fide marriage even if you don't live together. For instance, um, it could be the visits that you talked about. You, you come to visit each other. So you want to have proof of that. When he, you and um, your spouse are together in whatever country, you're taking pictures, you're doing stuff. If you're sending money to your spouse or he's sending money to you, that's great. Text messages, social media. Um, so you don't have to live together in this instance, okay? Because it's a consular processing. So when we talk about people living together, we're talking about people who live in the United States and are married in the United States. Uh, so you're welcome. So Real Olumide Bab says, can you travel out of the United States while waiting for the 10 year green card renewal with an extension letter I-751 without a problem on arrival? So you have an I-751, right? You can travel because your I-751 extension letter plus your, um, expired green card plus your passport is like your renewed green card you can travel just make sure you have no inadmissibility issues like you haven't been arrested you didn't commit a crime because that could make that could be a problem on when you're when you're coming back and also always make sure that um you don't have because even if you're a green card holder they can call you for secondary inspection where they go through your your car, uh, your phone, they go through your luggage, they go through stuff. And if they see anything that's problematic, they can, you can be put in deportation proceedings or they can take your, begin to plan to take your green card from you. So 
the, the issue is not whether you have the permission to travel. It's the same as when you had your green card, as long as you have your extension letter, your passport, and the expired green card. The issue is making sure you have no inadmissibility issues because having a green card does not stop you from being deported. Okay. All right. And Kunle says, I can't hear anything. Can you guys hear me? I hope. Okay. CB title said, thank you. So they heard me. Kunle X King. I think that's um, a problem with your phone. Um, so let's see. Um, da Danicia said, okay. I think I answered this question already. Agnes says, can you marry someone on welfare? Well, you can marry someone on welfare as long as they have somebody, a joint sponsor, because clearly they're on welfare, they cannot afford, um, they're likely not able to uh, um, qualify to um, to file the affidavits of support alone. They're going to need um, for you to get a joint sponsor. Uh, so yes, you can, okay? Uh, I know people on, some people on welfare do not want to get married because they may lose their welfare benefits if the other person is making a lot of money, but that's a separate issue. And that's what you guys as a couple have to discuss. Um, so, um, to Ebel says, let's say an undocumented person marries a citizen. Is it okay to have a kid before the interview for the green card? Uh, are you asking if you're just going to have a kid just to go for the interview? Because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> Um, you can marry an undocumented person, right? If you're a U.S. citizen, of course. Um, but you want to make sure that it's a bona fide relationship. And just having a kid doesn't really mean that it's a bona fide relationship. You have you have to prove other things. I mean, having a kid, you know, is you know, typically they they assume that when people have children that they're in a real relationship. But don't think that just because you have a child that you're going to get a way through. So um, if you're married to somebody who's undocumented, you can file papers for them as long as they were inspected and admitted. Because if they were not inspected and admitted, they're going to have to get a waiver, 601A waiver. They have to leave and get the visa from their embassy. All right. So let's see. Let me go back to Insta Instagram. Let's see. Instagram. All right, Instagram says, what to do if the spouse puts you out of the house before the green card interview? So that's D. Rila V. Don. So D. Rila V. Don, it sounds to me that you might have a VAWA case. This sounds like some kind of abuse. They're kicking you out of the house before the green card interview. But I need to know more about this case before I can tell you whether you qualify um, for VAWA. Okay, so call my office, 973-993-1900. And I'm really sorry if this happened to you. Um, this sounds horrible. So Danisha says, when you approve for VAWA, how long to file citizenship? Does it count the marriage period? So Danisha, when you file for VAWA and you're, uh, um, you get your VAWA approved, then you get your green card, not just the VAWA, because the VAWA can be approved. Um, the I-485 is where you get your green card, okay? So when you get your green card through VAWA, you can apply for citizenship within three years, all right? Now, um, in other instances, like if you get it through a family member or if you, get, if you were married and no, no longer with your, with your spouse, you have to wait for five years. I hope that helps. So I think that's pretty much, that's all the questions I've gotten today. So, all right, guys. Um, so listen up. If you, if you got something from this um, video, it's don't wait to file for your marriage-based green card because timing is everything. And if you need our assistance, feel free to call us 973-993-1900. Uh, my name is Ifama Odalami. My law firm is in New Jersey, but we assist clients in all 50 states. So guys, it's been real. If you have any questions, just send us a DM because a lot of times I'm trying to figure out what topics to talk about. And so that might be helpful in giving me um, something that I could bring in and talk to you guys about um, and keep you guys updated. Okay. Well, thank you for listening and I will sign out now. Take care.